what's up YouTube so as you can see the making of the mind the neuroscience of human nature and through reading this book I realized that that I just I like reading about neuroscience you know whether it be all these like as you can see all these things right here <coughs> I just I like learning about this stuff and also the the history part of it I like I realize that too that I like reading about the history of things which I think it's a great thing you know personally I think it's it's good to have something that you like and to have something that you look forward to in your life so we can get started now with this analysis I was looking for for what to call this and it might just be an analysis just a, a brief analysis or maybe it's kind of like a summary I should say except I'm kind of giving my opinions on some parts of the book so the human brain let's start we know that there's five main modalities for the five senses and to those modalities there are different yeah different different sub modalities like for instance touch in touch we have obviously the normal touch with the somewhat to sensory modality and then we have the proprioception which is it has to do with the muscle splendid, splend, spindles lengthening and shortening so like for example I, I seen a webinar a few months ago and the example he gave was put your hand behind your behind your back and how can you feel it like I could feel my hands but it's not touching nothing and it's just flowing in free space where I can still I can still feel it and that's proprioception so so as you can see there's there's different modalities inside of the main modality and well obviously we know we already know the five senses but so later on not later on but we can go into kind of the history portion of the book because this was this was actually kind of like a, a historical work pretty much they talked about the differences between the past and now basically <laughs> so <laughs> so let's start with the Neanderthals so obviously they had they had the ability to to do things kind of like a modern human but not exactly because they were, they were missing one key thing but they were able to make tools like for instance I read a a comic in the past where the Neanderthals were fighting another race whom I forgot I forgot their names actually but they were fighting and both had weapons and both were in tribes so obviously they were they were not totally impotent if that's the correct word use so they were they weren't really stupid we could say but what they were missing was the ability to to upgrade their tools so with that that's that has to do with the advanced working memory because they have to be able to just come up with new things so the advanced version which is what we humans now have we have the ability to innovate and make new things with our mind through our mind and body together so aside from aside from the Neanderthals just the past in general compared to us now the the big um, the big difference between us now in the past is social intelligence and with that social intelligence we we basically have the ability well with social intelligence comes language because that's another big difference 
in the past people didn't they didn't have a language and well when I say in the past that's very vague but you know like hundred thousand years ago <laughs> fifty like fifty thousand years ago well maybe they had language then but just know it in the past sometimes long time BC a long time before or BCE before common era if you're not a Christian so with the social intelligence that is we got our social intelligence through the neocortex which is the primary yeah I could say that's basically the the difference between us and apes is that our neocortex is massively bigger like either three to six times bigger depending on the ape so so that's basically the difference between us and apes and I said in the past video that our brain just grows bigger and it keeps growing until long after puberty but maybe just a few more years after puberty while well no more than 10 years after puberty starts our brain still is growing while the apes their brains stop growing after puberty before sorry so with the social intelligence that gives us the ability to of course to to to, to communicate with others and we, through that we receive the theory of mind and when I think about the theory of mind I don't know why it's called a theory <laughs> Because it, it's basically an ability. It's our ability to think what someone else is thinking. Or to think or not think, but necessarily just try and see, understand what someone else is feeling or thinking. So if someone else is crying, we can infer, well, we infer in our mind that they're sad when they might be crying out of joy. So, well, the theory of mind is, is pretty interesting because we get that when we were three and four years old. And it basically, it's us trying to be in, live in someone else's mind for a short while. Well, not necessarily live, but try and be them and feel what they feel. And when we do that, we also emulate what they do. So if someone else is crying, that's why... Yeah, the example I'm trying to give. That's why when someone else is crying, we may start to cry because we see them crying and we're trying to emulate how they feel because we're basically creatures of imitation. You know, we imitate other creatures, other animals. And, well, basically we imitate ourselves or, or by ourselves, I mean other homo sapiens. And that's how we, that's how we learn, first of all, through imitation. But aside from aside from the social intelligence, in the past few I'm pretty sure they said eight thousand. In the past eight thousand or so years, we've evolved rapidly. Rapidly and it doesn't seem like it. Well obviously, you know, me being a young guy and under twenty years old, or a young man I should say, and under twenty years old. No, I haven't experienced a lot of a lot of life. And I don't I can't say I don't know a lot of the history because one, I don't know a lot of history, so I can't say it. But I do understand some concepts of history and some parts of history. So I understand that it's a long time, but since I just can't think of I just can't think of 10,000 years. I just don't know what it would be like, basically. So, I can't say that it's been a short time. But through the book, they said that because the past 8,000 years, we pretty much didn't evolve. But in the past 8,000 well, 8, years, before the, before the first 8,000 years. So... Because in the past 8,000 years, we made or found, I should say, agriculture. And agriculture created the first cities, which created the first empires. 
and the War and Peace and War, I've learned that empires come from cooperation and trust and religion. So, by that time, 8,000 years ago, our social intelligence was smart enough to be able to to have this stuff. So, 8,000 years ago, what we received, I can't say we received it then, because there was probably, we probably had social intelligence before, before those 8,000 years, but when we received that, that's when we made everything, and it was just like a ball rolling. And then 7,600 years later, or 7,500 years later, we made, or I can't say we, the Gutenberg printing press came out. And through that, you know, the mass mass literacy happened. Everyone had books now. And then, obviously, in the 21st century, we now have computers. We have technology. And we have the ability to communicate with other people across across the world and across the nation, like I'm um, talking with you. is You know, I'm in the comfort of my home, and you may also be in the comfort of your home, or you may be doing something. But I think it's pretty, it's pretty cool that that we, because of our social intelligence, we have the ability to evolve. We we've had the ability to evolve, and I'm gonna read on that. I'm gonna read how we're gonna evolve next. Stephen King, or my bad, not Stephen King, Stephen Hawking. He believes that it's going to be through gene mutation just because someone, he says, someone has to do it. You know, so. But we'll, I'll, I'll read up on that later in the future. So, you know, like I said before or early in this video, language was a big part. And <laughs> we could just keep it at that. Language was a big part. With because well we can go into it briefly because of language we ha had the ability to talk to ourselves in our mind which is another benefit of having a neocortex because we are able to talk to ourselves through our mind and we could just keep it briefly there <laughs> so now we can go into consciousness which it would have been great if I would have well I still can honestly because I've I've made a lot of videos in the past that unfortunately they were I was unable to post them because I didn't know how to record at the time. So on a lot of books that I read. So this stuff is kind of like if you were to if you were to watch those videos that I made, which unfortunately I deleted and like you kind of know the stuff that I already know, so that that that's a cool thing because I already interpreted. I mean, I didn't interpret, but I already read a book on consciousness and not the parts of the brain that make us conscious, but basically the principles of consciousness. And that book was called The History of the Mind, if a history of the mind. If you want to go read that, so consciousness and. Well, the the left brain, or the left hemisphere, is basically related with consciousness. And because that's where the, the interpreter is. And also, <laughs> the interpreter. The interpreter is kind of the parts of our brain that, that talks. You know, if you hear, if you hear, words in your head that's that's the interpreter talking and the book gave a funny example honestly and this this example is i think it can go with a lot of people so they talked about how when you're driving in the road and you cut cut off someone or you cut in front of them while you know like i said you're driving on the road you think oh my bad my bad it's a mistake it's a mistake while if someone cut you off in the road <laughs> You would say that, oh, they're crazy, they're lunatic, they must be drunk. And that's basically the interpreter doing his thing. Because the interpreter, it 
Betsy thinks itself is good and itself is, you know, reasonable. While other people, they have to be crazy. Well, not even crazy because people don't call each other crazy now. They call it, I don't know what they call it, but people don't call each other crazy anymore. At least from what I know. (laughs) So the, the interpreter and... And the interpreter also sees the positive. Well, not necessarily the positive, but like how I explained in my analysis of the Spartans. The interpreter, it, or not the interpreter, but our brains, by our brains, I mean ourselves. And by ourselves, I mean our cells, because that's really necessarily what we're, we basically all are just a bunch of cells. <laughs> But throughout the, yeah, throughout our childhood, we don't think of, we don't think that we're going to die. And that's the interpreter thinking, you know, we're not going to die. Like death, that's what happens to to old sick people. (laughs) When in reality, and this is, again, what I learned through the Spartans and what I learned reading history, is everyone's going to die. And you could say, well, yeah, we already knew that. But what I mean is, when I said I learned it, because I just, I had it in my mind, while other people, they don't have it in their mind. They don't they don't think that death is going to happen to them. When, it will. Just to put it, just to keep that short. And another thing that I really liked about this book, well, <laughs> I... If you read How to Read a Book, then you should know that, which I've read, you should know that the the author, well, I read the edition with Charles Van Doren, and he says that you shouldn't judge a book yet until you understand it fully, which I don't understand this book fully, but there are some parts that, that I really did enjoy reading. For instance, this, they're, they're not, not their interpretation, but time travel and how us humans can time travel and this is what I've read through another cognitive neuroscience book but I really believe that we have the ability to time travel and because obviously with our memories and our hippocampus we have the ability to think back in time and we also have the ability to think forward in time with I would say dreams in a sense and also through just to believing something will happen. So, like for instance, I had a dream one day that I was working out, and the next day I went and worked out. Well, and I did the exact same exercise, but I don't think that's. <laughs> I don't know if I was really looking into the future there. I think that was just my. <laughs> just I just made a mental picture of what I what I wanted to do tomorrow. But hey. That actually is future time travel. Okay, so hey, you can time travel too. It doesn't have to be, we don't have to break the so-called space-time continuum and go back in time to time travel. Or reverse time, I should say. Because that's the that's the way to time travel. You reverse time through going, supposedly just go super quick in a spaceship. <laughs> so... Other things that that I kind of yeah, there's another thing that I wanted to talk about with this book. Well, not this book in general, but the past book I read, Glut. They talked about <laughs> they talked about how <laughs> how a dude in the past supposedly he remembered. I think it was a hundred thousand lines of a poem or a play. So he remembered a hundred thousand lines, and they talked about and they they mentioned it briefly in here, not the hundred thousand lines, but that the twenty first century kids basically twenty first century American modern American that they have a short attention span and they can't remember much and <laughs> I thought it was funny, and I was actually gonna try because or try to kind of do things on my remember trying to remember things on my own because like with these videos I have I take notes on the book 
And honestly, I don't, when I make these videos, I don't look through the notes. I just look at the chapter headings. And I kind of just talk about what I remember from from that. But I was thinking, what would happen if I did not have the chapter headings open? And if I just... And if I just tried and talked about what I remember from the book there. And by that I mean, you know, what I remember more, or what I remember less. What I gain greater memory. You know, would my hippocampus be working more? And things of the such, but... I'll try, I'll try that out next. Because yesterday I finished reading three books. And honestly, I'm going to... And this is one of them. So I'm just going to publish this one. And then I'll do another one today. So... Yes, because... Well, there was... Those three books that I read yesterday, all of them were useful. But the next one I'll do, I'll try and... Just go with what I remember. And actually, I remembered a lot from it. Obviously, we <laughs> I don't even have to look at it now. I could just start talking about it. But that's for the next video. So, the making of the mind, neuroscience of human nature. It's a pretty, it's a pretty good book. But oh yes, I like ending off on what's the meaning of the book. The meaning of the book is that we're special. I kind of talk about the the negative parts of the human, or for instance, that we're all gonna die. But in reality, we're special. There's no other ape that's or no other primate that's necessarily like us. In the fact that we have the ability to talk to ourselves through language, and we also have the ability to do like what I'm doing here, making a video through through technology, through the internet. So, don't take this stuff for granted. Really, really be grateful for it like I am. The making of the mind.